Hi, I'm Lisa Givens, and this is a true personal story. I feel like, Pops, this is, this day is really a gift where we get to talk about the time you almost didn't make it, instead of me telling someone else about that awful night when my dad had a heart attack that was fatal. It really is a gift because I, at one time, I didn't think I was going to make it. The night this whole saga began, it started with an unexpected drop to the floor. I knew I was having a heart attack when I walked out of the bathroom and I felt like a Mack truck had run over my chest and I fell to the floor and I was in excruciating pain. It was amazing to me how soon the emergency vehicles got here. It was less than five minutes and uh, it's only because I had Phillips Lifeline and had pushed the button and they responded immediately. Having been Carlos Gibbons' physician for over 20 years and his friend, I am delighted that he has a Phillips Lifeline. It's very clear that the longer a patient stays on the ground, the worse the outcome. Phillips changes all of that. The Lifeline monitor gets help in minutes and it can save many, many, many lives. About four years ago, I had a I guess a mild heart attack, and luckily it wasn't enough to take me out. I think all my children got together and decided that dad needs something to give him some assurance should he have any f further complications. And he's like, I'm fine, you know, nothing's ever gonna happen to me. I don't need any kind of a monitoring device. I don't need a, a medical alert system. He didn't want to seem vulnerable. He didn't want to seem old. Who wants that, right? We insisted. So I've been wearing Phillips Lifeline for about the last three years. And luckily I had it on June the 3rd of this year when my major heart attack struck. The Phillips Lifeline has given me my normal life back. I can uh, work in my garden, I can fish, I can do shrubbery, I can visit neighbors, I can go to the post office or the grocery store. How cool is it that technology has advanced and that Philips has found a way to incorporate into the lifeline this fall detection so if you can't call for help, if you're unconscious or if you're disoriented, it senses that you need help and it will, it will find where you are. Yeah, That's amazing. I, yes, I agree. What would you say to people who have been where you've been? Thinking, I don't need anything, I don't want to go to that trouble, I don't want to look old. I would say to everyone that you should not wait, you should go ahead and get a, a Phillips Lifeline and you got to be prepared. The fact that you're here and can hold my hand and can talk to me about what was and what is. You're going to make me cry now. I love you, Pops. Thank you all, and thank you, Lisa, for being here today at AOL. So excited. How's everybody? Good? Yeah, we're great. Good. Well, that was such a touching, heartwarming video, but something that really speaks to what a lot of us are dealing with or might be dealing with in the future. Can you talk a little bit about why, why this is so important to you? Because I know you have a background of you know, caregiving, really. I'm so happy to be here to talk about what I think is the biggest game changer in caregiving today, and that is technology. Yeah. You know, all of this is all based on the fact that we've got super cool technology that keeps us connected. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're like me, a daughter or a son or a husband or a wife, and you are taking care of someone you love, in this case, my, my dad, how great that we have options like a, a medical alert device like Philips Lifeline, like smart homes, uh, like medication dispensing services so that we can keep people safe, um, give peace of mind and keep everybody on track. Look, we all wanna live to be 100 and, and that's looking more and more likely, but we wanna get there independently and we know that the vast majority of us wanna to continue to live on our own. Sometimes we just need support to do that. Sure. I know that you experienced um, Alzheimer's disease with your family, your mom and your grandmother. Um, and you, can you talk a little bit about that experience and um, what led you to start your own foundation? So if you look to the person to your left and the person to your right, here's the statistics. Um, one of them will probably have a memory disorder like Alzheimer's. The other will be the person who cares for you. 
my mother and my granny, the two most amazing women who gave me my compass for how I want to be and show up in the world, both had this thief of memories. And it's so unacceptable that it's the, of the top 10 diseases, this is number six, but it's the only one for which there are no treatments, no cures, no way to really stop it or halt it. So while we are on the way to getting there with the science, we've got a lot of people that need care. My mother, 10 years disappearing day to day to day. My granny, 12 years. Look at what happens. Um, if you're the caregiver, and there are a lot of people in their teens that are taking care of their parents or grandparents, if you're the caregiver, your life's on hold, your savings are depleted, you're trading off your future in many cases because you want to care for this person, but there's not enough, enough time, enough money, enough anything. What are some signs that you should look for when you have an aging parent that maybe something is a little off or maybe they need an extra hand? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question because... You know, we think our parents are invincible. My dad, you know, thinks he's John Wayne. I thought he was John <laughs> Wayne. I'm like, nothing's ever going to happen. Um, when your parents change their behavior, or maybe the hygiene changes a little. Now, this was my mom with the Alzheimer's. My mother was always very outgoing. She would be here. She would know all of your names by now. She would have invited you over to Thanksgiving dinner. That was my mom. But she began to get a little more reclusive. Um, she wasn't brushing her teeth. She would repeat herself, which is the classic sign. But my dad was covering for her because they have a secret language like couples do. Yeah. And so those of us, I was a long distance caregiver. I didn't see her as often. And even my brother and sister who live in town couldn't tell how fast she was declining. And she didn't want us to know. So when you look at your parents and maybe they're having disorientation, they, they can't figure out time and space, they're getting lost on the way somewhere, they're feeling uncomfortable in crowds, there's no food in the refrigerator, the food is spoiled that's in there, um, they rush you off the phone, those kinds of things, just to be on the lookout. I commend you for talking about this because I think it's something that we don't really you know, talk to our friends about on a daily basis until you actually have to deal with it. And I think the yeah. more prepared you can be, the better. How do you balance as a busy you know, woman and you're doing so many different things, being that caregiver from far away and also keeping up your own life? Because I'm sure that's a little bit challenging. Well, there's 65 million of us. Yeah. And you know how when you had maybe a Sweet 16 party or you graduated from high school, you you know, get all these congratulations and you get these cards. That doesn't happen when you become a caregiver. No one says, this is great. It's your first day as a caregiver for the rest of your life. Do a great job with that. Yeah. <laughs> no one really notices it, so we don't really put the label on. We're like, well, I'm her daughter. Of course I'm going to show up and help. Um, I'm his son. I'm just doing what, what sons are supposed to do. And that's true, but we do it without any training, without education, without support. And here's the honesty bomb. When you're caring for someone you love, chances are, and if this is your mom or someone that you know, who is the caregiver, and maybe someday it'll be you, you're erasing years off your life. So it's like, chick, here, start the ticking clock backwards. Chick, 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 chick. 10 years you can give because it's an assault on your system. Um, it's compassion fatigue. And we know when you're dealing with stress, your body handles it in different ways if you don't have outlets for it. Caregivers are disappearing. Now, we may not be able to cure all these diseases. We couldn't fix the Alzheimer's. But I started my foundation because I thought, wow, we can change that. That's something we can really scratch that track and make a different reality for people. You mentioned earlier that um, your mom and your grandmother served as a, a compass for you. What's the best advice or inspiration they each gave you? Well. There was no whining at my house. My mother, a southern steel magnolia who was all about finding your strength and showing up. She would say to me, honey, look, show up, do your best, let go of the rest. And that letting go part was the hardest for me um, because I wanted to fix everything. And it's still the best advice I've, I've ever gotten. Uh, so many words of wisdom from my mom, she would always say, you know, I don't care how many great jobs you think you're going to have in your life and how much success you will achieve, and I know you can do whatever you want, honey, but never look down on anyone unless you are reaching out your hand to lift them up. And my, my parents 
taught me what became the safest place for me to be in the midst of crisis, which is to get outside of yourself, right? To find strength by seeing what you can offer others. And uh, when my mother got Alzheimer's disease, she knew where she was going because she saw my granny disappear. She lined us all up and she said, all right, I have a big brother, little sister. And she said, now listen, when I can no longer call you by name, I don't want to live with you. I don't want to live with you, and I don't want to live with your sister. And you have to tell daddy when it's time to let me go. Oh. And she gave us our marching orders, which I thought, what a beautiful thing that is. So now is the time, if your parents are healthy and you have a strained relationship or a loving, close relationship, now is the time to talk about your wishes. It kept our family from unraveling. And typically what happens when there is a health crisis that breaks into your domestic bliss, families fall apart um, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually. They just unravel. And we didn't because my mother had this infinite strength, really. Wow, that's a lot to take away from. That's really great advice. Betty White is part of this campaign. Yes. And she, everybody loves her. Uh, you know, what's she like behind the scenes? What's she like, you know, not as the, the golden girl that we know? Betty White is my favorite optimist. Um, she, it's funny because I was with her and I said, Betty, you're going to be 100 soon. We really need to figure out how we're going to celebrate your birthday. And she paused for a second. She goes, oh, Lisa, I can't make it. I'll be working. <laughs> and it's true. You know, she is so grateful. She lives in gratitude. She loves what she does. Um, she shows up every day with her curiosity and her generosity. And when I was trying to convince my dad to get a Phillips Lifeline, he wasn't so keen on it at first. A lot of people don't want to seem vulnerable. And daddy was kind of pushing back. And um, ultimately, obviously, he, he did it because I said, you know, oh, daddy, it's not for you, it's for me. It really was for me. Sure. Um, but when I said, Daddy, you know who else has a Phillips Lifeline? Betty White. My dad thinks now he needs an agent. He's, <laughs> he thinks he's like, you know, a rock star now. You know, myself and Betty White, we both have this. She wears it to work. And, you know, she has it like underneath her shirt. You don't see that you have it on. That's a big part. Yeah. We stigmatize. We polarize. We disenfranchise people who are older. We don't see them. So I challenge everyone you know, see the youth that's in us, in our parents. You know, as we get older, we're just, we're still the young person just in an older presentation. And that's what Betty White does. She allows us to see the youth and the energy behind her 99 years. It's incredible. Amazing. Well, I can't wait till she turns 100, and I hope she is working that it's day. It's a national holiday. Yeah. <laughs> she can work, but we're taking it off. <laughs> And your dad is so cute, so uh, it's really sweet to see him react that way to Thank that. you. Is a daddy adorable? He's adorable. Here's, I give it to my dad. Um, he continues to live a big life. Uh, my mom died in 08. My dad has a girlfriend. You know, she's, she's like beautiful, and she drives him around her hot little car. And um, they are busy and in love. And um, it's never that relationship with my dad where it's like, well, you didn't call me. You never come see me. We do talk to each other. We do see each other often. But he has a life. He should have a life. And he's able to now because he doesn't have to worry about falling. He doesn't have to worry about taking his meds at the wrong time. He can just focus on being my fantastic pops. Well, you look phenomenal, Lisa. What do you do to stay in shape and stay healthy? First of all, thank you for that question. That's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> Remember that advice my mother gave me, um, let go of the rest. Yeah. Um, I, when I was your age and, um, you know, feeling a lot of pressure, as we all feel, and now it's even more pressure because we, we see the mirror coming back to us, you know, on Instagram and Snapchat, and we're like, oh, my gosh, everybody's got perfect kids, and they've got a perfect life, and, you know, look at all these crafts on Pinterest, and then there's me. And I think we all feel, you know, sometimes inadequate because it seems impossible. I... Um, learned to uh, stop achieving and start receiving because it is our highest point of humanity when we can open up and let other people be there for us. And when we're trying to be all that, sometimes we, we can't do that. But um, I used to chase the same five pounds and, um, and it was maddening. And I, you know, I'd work out like crazy and I, 
it, it just, it drove, it kept me from being present in my life. When I gave up that vision of what size I should be, um, I just became much happier and much more accepting. And I, I stay healthy. Um, I work out about four days a week. Um, I try to meditate. I'm trying to be, really work into my mindfulness. Um, that's an evolving skill. And, you know, I try to eat healthy. There's no, there is no secret weapon. There's no magic bullet. Because I have two women in my life, two generations of Alzheimer's, people say to me, well, oh my gosh, that means you're next. Well, you could be next because it's Russian roulette. Um, you have a brain, you're at risk. Now, those of us who have it in our families are at greater risk, but it's not that we're definitely going to get it or definitely not going to get it. I think we should all treat our health as though what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So even taking walks, taking a break, doing 10 purposeful breaths, these are the things that we go, yeah, yeah, whatever, and we're very dismissive. Those are things that can save your life and can prolong your life and make you feel that you do have control. We are the masters of our destinies. And I am a fierce optimist. Uh, that's the title of a book that I wrote. I believe it makes a difference. Uh, I, I know that it opens up neural pathways in your brain so that you can connect to your resilience, so that you can connect to your problem solving. And I believe that there, there's a place for optimism in healthcare as well. I it's been that. proven. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And it and can relate to lots of parts of your life, not yes. just that, everything, healthcare, career. So, right. so what do you owe your success? You know, being in the business for so long, the entertainment business, uh, you know, so many, so many people struggle to make it. I've enjoyed the struggle. I anticipated the struggle. I expected the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I find strength within that. So I think expectation is important in everything, but I never viewed the struggle as a negative. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it was much easier for women of my generation to break away from the pack. You know, if you want to be the cream that rises to the top, you have to separate from the rest of the milk, and that can be pretty lonely. And it can be scary to be feel that you're on your own and you're not following a path that everybody else followed. Um, but those are choices that I think are much harder for the faces I see in this audience and many people that are watching us right now. I think that it's, it's so much more difficult in my field in the broadcast business, um, being a communicator, being a storyteller. And I, I feel blessed that I came of age and I owe uh, my path to so many other women who came before me, one of whom uh, is a woman named Gloria Steinem, and she says something that inspires me a lot, which is, the truth will set you free, but first it's going to piss you off. <laughs> and the truth is, it's not always the people who are the best educated or the people who are the, have the best skill set who win. Um, the truth is, it's how you look at things that determine how far you get to go, right? Um, that's, that's what determines your path. You know, the world isn't as it is, it's as we see it. And if you see it as a place of great opportunity, you get what you focus on, you will bring in great opportunity. Well, you channeled that success uh, when we saw you on The Celebrity Apprentice a few years back. So congratulations, Thank many you. years later. What are some of your favorite memories from being on that series? hi yi 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 I truly was um, overwhelmed by the environment because remember before Donald Trump was our president-elect, he was the host of Celebrity Apprentice and his boardroom was known for being a place so difficult that it would bring the, the toughest guys and the meanest girls to tears and tantrums. And you know, there's a lot of drama, drama, drama. And I thought, so not for me. I mean, you know, I've got my PhD in drama avoidance. I'm not going to go there. That doesn't work. I can't, I, I can't do that. Um, but the difference was, and my husband helped me see this and really pushed me to step forward. I had, I love to work. I understand business. I love business. Um, I said to my husband, you know, I'm not so sure about these reality shows. You know, I did Dancing with the Stars and that didn't work out so great. Um, and he said to me, well, you can't dance. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you know business and yeah. this is your language and 
this is a platform for you to talk about the thing you care about, for you to talk about family caregivers, for you to talk about families that are facing an illness as difficult as Alzheimer's. That was my burning desire. That's what got me to the finish line because people, I think, dismissed me early on as, oh, you're an easy out. You're too nice. Push over. But that's the thing. Nice girls and nice guys are just as competitive as everybody else. And you don't have to trip someone else up to get what you want to win. You don't. You just get there on your merits. And you can let other people strengthen their strengths while you're strengthening yours. And you can fight like hell to win. We all want to win. But I didn't want to win at any cost. And the reason I was able to put my head down, and my mother would always tell me, stay in your lane, run your race. Don't look at all the other horses, run your race. I was able to do that because I so much wanted to honor her legacy, my family's story. Well, I love that. Well, um, I thank you so much for coming today uh, to AOL series here. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. I would love to hear from the audience here. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Good. Um, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about your process of how you create awareness for a cause that means a lot to you? Thanks for the question because I think that especially now, all of us need to remember that the way we exert ourselves is, you know, the causes we support, the organizations with which we affiliate, and how we, how we exercise our, our voices and uh, how we define ourselves. I think right now we're looking at how, do we, how are we defining ourselves as a country? And, um, and each of us has a, has a place in that. I think there's a lot of examples for people going from adversity to advocacy. And sometimes when there's an intervening reality, like there was for me, um, the way to deal with it is to reach beyond. So I think that's a path that always, always, always works. But you know, if your life is going along great, um, then I think the thing to do is to find ways to celebrate your strength, to celebrate what works for you, to celebrate the gratitude that you have. If we look back to our gratitude, that's the foundation for all abundance. If you're grateful for what you have, you're definitely going to get more. So I think when you're looking for passions and causes, go back to what you're grateful for. Look at what, what, what brings that into play for you. What's the focus? And that's probably going to give you your answer of where you're going to be, where you're going to find your bliss and where it's going to be the easiest for you to, to give your energy. If there are people in your life right now who are caring for a grandmother, a mom, a dad, someone who has a disability, someone who has autism, cancer, Alzheimer's, whatever it is. Take a second to say to that person, wow, I know what you're doing is really hard. And you're doing a great job. Because we all want to be validated. We all want to be recognized for who we are and what we do. And caregivers disappear. And sometimes they fall into the background. And they're like part of the wallpaper. And people don't really see the incredible toll. They're giving like 20 hours of unpaid care on average a week. Now, these are people who have a job. They have kids or grandkids. Um, they've got all those stressors in their lives. But on top of their full-time job, they're giving 20 hours for free. $470 billion of unpaid care. That's the health care system, you guys. So for me, personally, I look at our new administration. Donald Trump's father had Alzheimer's disease. I know he cares about caregivers, and he has spoken about it, especially as it relates to our veterans and the spouses of our veterans that have a unique challenge. I hope that he will find it worthy to put a spotlight on greater funding and greater research for Alzheimer's because it will bankrupt Medicare, uh, and put a focus on the caregivers who are sacrificing so much to give so much. The theme of Caregiver Month is take care to give care. And we have to take care of ourselves, mind, body, soul, and spirit. And we have to also have to take care of each other. Thank you for the question. Next question. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Hi. Um, uh, my question is when you uh, decided that you wanted to turn this diversity into something that was positive um, and start the Caregiver's Month, were you thinking more along the lines that you wanted to reach out to find other people that had your story, or were you thinking along the lines of that you wanted to kind of teach um, 
how to be a caregiver when you're just coming from being a normal person to kind of motivate, motivate people to want to um, stay positive while they're doing it as well? Both. I think it's really important that we find community. And one of my greatest tips for caregivers is go tell it on the mountain, honey. Tell somebody. Um, when we keep things to ourselves, that's when depression comes in. That's when isolation happens. That's when we create lots of obstacles for our journey. So I really want to create awareness that, that we're out there, create a sense of solidarity with people, um, that we're in the same situation, and create empathy from other people who are not there or who are not there yet. Because you don't say, I want to grow up and be the world's greatest caregiver. You know, I used to do a lot of fantasy play with my Barbie dolls. Well, they were reporters, and they were in charge. My Barbie dolls didn't contemplate taking care of mom or dad. We don't really have a lot of role models for us to look to on ways to do it. It's just something that kind of happens. So, yes, I do believe we need education to tell people where do you find resources? I started Lisa's Care Connection because it's what I wish we'd had on our journey. And I wanted to create a place where families could begin to answer the question, now what? Oh my God, now what do I do? So how do I connect with resources? How do I get educated? How do I feel empowered on this journey? And how do I hang on to my own life? You know, I always tell caregivers, you deserve to have a life. It's not like you need to be a martyr and sacrifice everything. Because when you can connect to your own strength and when you can breathe in your own strength, you're going to get better outcomes for the care receiver. So better care for you means better outcomes for them. So you should never feel selfish about looking after yourself and taking those breaks and those moments that you need. Sure. We have one last question from the crowd here. Hey, do you have any advice on approaching siblings about dividing the responsibilities of caregiving? Siblings, I, I do. Uh, what happens when somebody gets sick in a family? All of our skeletons come tumbling out of the closet and all of our childhood wounds get you know, re-injured. And we often are at conflict with the people that we're closest with. There's usually someone in the family, sometimes it's the middle smarty pants child like me, um, often it's the daughter, uh, two thirds of caregivers are women, but there's someone who usually emerges and kind of puts themselves in the place or feeling like they have to be the place. I say to families, uh, the F words that make sense are flexibility and forgiveness. When we realize that we all have limits and when we can try to avoid saying, well, my brother's not showing up the way I am. Look at me, I'm here every day. Look what I've given up. I moved home to take care of mom. What are you doing? When we can avoid that, and when we can create weekly check-ins and everybody has a voice and we feel that everybody's voice is valued, that's gonna create a much better outcome. But I really believe that in my family, my brother is an attorney, so he was the one that was able to look at all of the legal things that have to happen when somebody gets sick, you know, the powers of attorney, uh, you know, the medications, all of that. He was able to handle that. My sister-in-law is a great researcher, and she's that detail person. She did that. My little sister did move home, and she took care of mom. And I was able to manage everybody, um, write some checks. Um, I was able to be the one to kind of move the big picture forward. So find your role. Um, forgive each other and, um, and, and try to talk about it when everybody's healthy. Great advice and excellent questions, crowd. Thank, thank you. you so much. You guys are fantastic. Yes. Thank you thank so you. much. You're really great. And Lisa, thank you. Thank you. Um, you're the role model now for this. So That's awfully thank kind. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Gibbons. Thank you, everyone. She's a caregiver. Yeah. <laughs>